something about the soil. It was about, it, it was geotechnical. Uh, with the engineering, I felt like I, I could actually touch the soil. And then after I got into a lab and then I got to go out on drill rigs, it was so much based on experience and what you have seen and how that soil behaves. It's not going to be the same every single time. And so there's always a challenge with it. It's a great industry for you know, people who like new things that pop up underground and who can deal with uh, changes as they happen. Uh, so it's rewarding and, and always full of new things. We definitely get the opportunity to be designer and builder all in one, and not everybody has that offering. Not every engineer has that ability in the pathways that they choose. It's, it's very satisfying. Um, a lot of, most of the work we do is never seen, um, but it's still satisfying to drive over a bridge knowing that I've had a hand in constructing it, or looking at a high-rise building, any beautiful building knowing that deep below the ground is my contribution to that structure. It's just a very satisfying feeling. Yeah. It's a very big industry, so you have a great opportunity to advance and to be able to uh, move forward in your career and become valuable to the industry or the company you're working for. What I like about soil is that it's, it's sort of a mystery below the ground, right? You only get to see a little bit of it at a, at a time and then try to interpret what's going on. So it's sort of a puzzle that you're putting together. DFI continues to expand globally as regional chapters grow and reach more practitioners with content that meets local needs and goals. Regional chapter leadership is steady and local staff are dedicated and enthusiastic, liaising productively with DFI headquarters. We are communicating effectively by assembling more frequently through in-person meetings and conference calls to maintain momentum on more than 100 ongoing projects and programs. Stay tuned for what the future brings for DFI. Get involved, join the DFI community, become an active member of a DFI committee, and join us in making a difference. Good evening, everybody. We welcome you all for this Steel Retaining Structures and Foundations um, webinar. I am Dr. Kumar Pichmani. I'm the moderator today. I am an executive committee member of DFI India. I work with AECOM. I'm the regional director at AECOM India, and my office is in Chennai. Please note, there are a few things that you need to follow. I'm sure you are all aware of this. Recording of this webinar is prohibited. 
then certificates will be prepared and emailed in approximately two weeks. Online webinar recording along with the presentation slides will be available in approximately two weeks. In case of any assistance during the webinar, please reach to Mahendran and Pranavja. The uh, numbers are given below. You can note it down. Then these are certain issues that you can sort it out. You can see the camera. You can select the computer audio. If you are not able to hear the audio, you adjust yourself. You use the computer audio. And then you have all these over here. There are three arrows pointed onto the right of your screen. All these are available. So you click on the first arrow to open the handouts tab and download reference documents and upcoming webinar details. Then you can click on the next one, which is the questions tab. This is where you can chat and this is the place where you can enter your questions. So whenever you enter your questions, please ensure that you give your name and the name of your organization. You can raise your questions during the seminar itself. You need not wait till the end. Okay, so that will give you a good opportunity to raise your questions. We have our sponsors, the webinar series sponsors, ArcelorMittal, Projects India Private Limited. These are the webinars that have started in July itself. Then this series co-sponsor is Teamwork Engineering Solutions Private Limited. Then sponsorship opportunities are all open. You can reach out to DFI India office and avail the open opportunities at the email address or the address given over there. The upcoming, there are a few more upcoming webinars. Today is the fifth one. Webinar number sixth is on 7th October, which is on innovative engineering solutions using pressing method by Tomotaka Hirose, Daikin Asia Private Limited. Webinar seven, details will be announced soon. The registration distribution, we have around 894 uh, registrants. See, con there are a lot of uh, people from all over the industry, academia. So you see contractor is 18%, specialized contractor 6%, service provider 5%, manufacturers and all uh, 4%. Then you have academia 31%, owners 8%, and then consultants contribute to 28%. So that's a big mix of people of registrants. The registrants, the demographic representation in today's session, we have people from 38 countries. So that's a huge number, a lot of people joining in and uh, taking advantage of this series. Today's seminar, we will follow the following sequence. First, I'll give you the introduction to the speaker. Then the presentation, I will leave the uh, flow open to the presenter. He will give his presentation. Then after his presentation, there will be a promotion. There will be promotional videos, question answer sessions. So whatever questions you have asked, you can will be moderated, and then appropriate questions will be asked for which uh, speaker will giving the will be giving the answers. Then details of DFI India 2020 virtual conference, and that will bring you to the end of webinar webinar five. Okay, so today's webinar, deep foundations, key walls, breakwaters built with circular cells, straight well, a uh, straight web steel sheet piles. The speaker is Jao Martins. He's a head of technical and marketing department of ArcelorMittal Commercial RPS Sheet Piling Luxembourg. So he's going to give you this presentation. Let me give me give him uh, let me give a brief introduction of martins mr martins started his professional career in 1996 as an inspection engineer in a consulting firm in luxembourg he then moved to arcelor mittal in 1999 he has held several positions in technical and marketing department of the sheet piling business he started designing sheet piles for customers and worked as a resident engineer in the US for three years, he had the opportunity to visit many job sites all over the world. Now, uh, now he works with the marketing department. He's a link between the R&D and sales department. You see, uh, 
highly technical person is now heading the marketing so that is the best thing that a company can look forward to a technical person who is into marketing will be able to sell the product the most efficient way so that is the greatness of martins welcome martins so the main mission of martins is develop and promote new innovative steel sheet pile solutions that is a company and that is the mission of jaw jaw martins so i welcome jaw martins to give his presentation i am sure you will all enjoy this presentation and uh, this will be very useful a very practical one which we are looking forward to welcome jaw thank you very much dr pichumani thank you welcome good afternoon to everybody so uh, during the next 45 minutes, I'll try to give you a brief overview of uh, the design and installation of um, circular cells. I'll focus on circular cells. There are other uh, ways to uh, use flat sheet piles to build, for instance, diaphragm walls, as we'll see. It's a relatively complex topic, especially the installation. And uh, I will only have time to give you a brief overview. So for the next... Uh, but before that, I would like to start with a summary. And uh, okay, about um, steel sheet piles, kind of a reminder, and it's quite important also for um, uh, other steel sheet piles, so for cold form, for hot roll, uh, but especially for um, flat sheet piles, there is in fact no standard uh, regarding the shapes and the sections of uh, sheet piles. So it is quite curious, but unlike uh, beams and sections, uh, we don't have one. So each manufacturer can develop its own shapes and be it a Z, a U type, or an H type, and also the interlocks. And uh, although the shapes look very familiar or very similar, um, the, the rolling tolerances will have an influence on parameters or characteristics of the sections like the interlock resistance of flat sheet pass as we'll see in a few slides and also the water type so this might be different another thing which is different is that um, when you design a sheet pass structure it doesn't care about the sheet pad itself nevertheless you have to be careful about uh, the assumptions that you make because for instance if you use u piles you might have to use reduction factors so this is something that you have to take into account. Even though the geotechnical design is the same, you might have uh, some implications if you use a certain type of um, sheet pass. So uh, we use in Europe the European standard, which is EN 1993 part five for the design of the steel and Eurocode seven for the geotechnical design. Another thing which is important to notice is that um, not all the profiles that you see in the catalogs, be it from ArcelorMittal or from other manufacturers, are available in all the steel grades. And as we saw in one of the previous presentations, the optimization normally takes into account the section properties, but also the steel grade. And if you use a high steel grade, normally you can use a lighter sheet pile. So when you do that um, type of optimization, you do also something for the environment because you use less steel, so less resources and a lower impact on the environment. Another interesting thing, for the flat sheet pass is um, that they have this interlock strength. So normally they are used to build coffer dams. And uh, here again, um, there is a definition of a coffer dam is different in Europe and in the United States, for instance. Very often coffer dams um, related to a structure which is built in the water in order to be able to work in the dry inside of the coffer dam. But sometimes people also um, use the word coffer dams for circular cells because this was the main application, especially in the United States. However, it is not limited to coffer dams, so it can also be used for other type of applications, like we'll see here in this picture. This is a key wall which is built um, with a circular cell, and what you can already see here is that you have two different, if you look at the um, uh, layout drawing is that you have two different diameters of the cell so this is important because you have to reduce the number of diameters because as you can see on the top picture here I'm sorry I'll use, uh, here 
is that you need a template to install the sheet pass. So the template is a relatively complex structure, quite heavy. It can be 20 or 30 tons each, so that it has a certain cost. And if you have to uh, prepare a template for different, um, different diameters, then you need different templates too. So here it's a relatively simple structure where you can also see that uh, there is a circular cells, but you have also this arc. So you have here one arc in the front and the lengths of the paths are relatively short between eight meters and 15 meters, but they can be much, much longer as we'll see. So this really depends on the soil conditions. Another type of applications, um, what we see on the next slide, which will come. So, okay. Is for instance, uh, circular cells that are used to protect uh, was too quick to protect a bridge piers. So on the um, picture here, or at least the one before that slide. I'm sorry, I, I lost my point. Uh, yeah, so on, on this one, is that you have these circular cells with a very small diameter, which is difficult with the new uh, sheet pass, but uh, it has been used as a cover dam so that they can build the bridge pier in the dry. And afterwards, they keep it in order to protect the bridge pier from the impact of the um, a ship or vessel. Now, when you talk about uh, bridge pier protections, it's clear that the sheet pass or the structure itself will absorb part of the energy, but on the other side, it will, to take or to absorb that energy, it will deform so that in the worst case scenario, you can uh, deteriorate or damage seriously the cell so that you have to repair it or uh, replace it. But on the other side, the most important thing is that the bridge pier is protected because it's much more expensive to replace a bridge than a circular cell. And the other thing is also that the ship will not uh, go down. So quite interesting type of applications. The next one is uh, one that was built in Hazira in India, a very long key wall, 1.1 kilometer long uh, deep draft bulk with diaphragm wall. So it's not a circular, but it's a diaphragm as you'll see uh, the difference in one of the next slides. And what you can also see on the right here is the, um, the template that was used. So they used a template, two level template. So you have two levels of platforms. And um, that are movable. So you can move it, uh, so to speak, in order to follow the driving steps. So what is the main difference between a flat sheet pile and the regular Z or U type sheet pile? Well, it's the fact that it doesn't resist through bending. So it doesn't have any flexural resistance, but it resists through interlock tension. So that's the main characteristic of a flat sheet pile is the interlock resistance. They are used for circular cells and diaphragm walls, mainly for deep walls, key walls, breakwaters and coffer dams. Another big advantage is that it's, uh, it can be used on the bedrock. So if you have a shallow bedrock, you don't need to penetrate into the ground. So if you have only a weathered bedrock or a few meters and it's not sufficient for a standard sheet pile, this is a type of solution that can be uh, used. The other advantage is that you don't need any anchors, but of course you need uh, steel. So it's a gravity structure. It's a gravity structure which is built with a steel membrane and inside a fill, which is normally granular, so sand or gravel. And what is also interesting to uh, notice is that the interlock tension, so T on uh, this picture, is proportional to the, radi the radius of the cell, in this case, and proportional to the pressure inside. So this means that if you have a big cell with a big radius, the tension will be very high. And if you have a small cell, the tension will be very small but it will also depend on the pressure inside. So the pressure of the soil, of course, but also the pressure of the water. Now, if you go to the design of uh, such complex structures, uh, there are a few, um, or a few 
books that can be used or and recommendations. One that's uh, relatively complete and up to date is the EAU, so the, from the German Committee for Waterfront Structures. You'll find an older one, older version in the United States from the US Corps of the Army of Engineers and also from the TVA. So you can download that free from the internet. It gives you the basic design assumptions that were taken in the past, but not the ones that are used nowadays in Europe, because in Europe now it's based on a logarithmic spiral and not on the methods that were used in the past. And for the French speaking, persons there is a very interesting um, reference book also that was published a little bit more than 20 years ago from a French engineer which uh, was uh, named Tui which also treats this particular sec uh, structures in detail and you'll also find in our brochure a detailed uh, design how to design it but also an example of uh, design and also for the installation so most of the pictures that you'll see today are anyway uh, found, you can find them in this brochure. So a flat sheet pile, as I said, is something which doesn't resist by flexion, so it doesn't have any flexural stiffness. It's like a spaghetti, which would be cooked al dente, for instance, so you can lift it, you can do whatever you want with it, but you have to be very careful because it's uh, fragile in that sense that it doesn't have any flexural stiffness. So in fact, in the catalogs, you'll find the nominal width of 500, but for the installation, you should consider 503 millimeters, which takes into account the play uh, and also uh, the tolerances. They are available in different thicknesses. For instance, uh, from uh, our manufacturing, um, we supply in thickness from 9.5 up to 13 meters, and with an interlock resistance, which we guarantee, which is uh, 3.5. Well, 3,500 kilonewtons per meter for the very small one, for the 9.5, up to 6,000 kilonewtons per meter. So you have to imagine if you take a sample which is one meter high, you can pull on it with a force of 600 tons. So it's a huge resistance, but nevertheless, for very big structures, it might not be sufficient. So there are other solutions than the circular cells. Steel grade is also an important parameter for regular sheet piles, for standard Z and U piles. For flat sheet piles, it has an influence on the interlock strength. So if you go for the interlock strength for 6,000 kilonewtons per meter, then you have to use a steel grade, which is the S430 or above. So this is something that the manufacturer has to uh, provide. Nowadays, anyway, 320 and below are not really very used, but in this case, for flat sheet pass, it has to be something above 355. We can also supply according to ASTM, grade 50 and above. So uh, this is almost the same. It's just a chemical composition that changes a little bit, but not that much of an influence on the interlock resistance, because the interlock resistance depends a lot on the shape. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. So even though the interlocks might look similar, uh, the interlock resistance as uh, might be different from manufacturer to manufacturer because of these interlock uh, shapes but also the running tolerances so you have two different types of cells the first one as i said are the circular cells so the, at the top and then the diaphragm cells so what's the main difference in one when would you use one or the other one so when to choose the circular cells and one the diaphragm cell generally speaking circular cells are easier to install so we would go with circular cells. On the other hand, circular cells are limited because of the diameter. So the interlock strength is proportional to the radius, which means that in general, if you have a diameter of above 25, so 25 to 30 meters, depending on the soil conditions and the loadings, the interlock strength, the interlock tension will be too high. So in that case, you would go to a diaphragm cell, but there are other considerations which can uh, be more beneficial for the diaphragm cells. The advantage of the diaphragm cell is that you can choose the radius. So when you see the R here, this is something that you can choose so that the distance between the straight walls, uh, you can choose it. So you can have a relatively small radius compared to a circular cell, but you can increase the length of the diaphragm wall, so the straight wall, to the infinity. So it can be as long as you want. So you can have 25 meters, you can have 30, you can have 40, 50 meters, without having an influence on the interlock tension. So this is the advantage of the diaphragm cells compared to 
circular cells, but as I said, circular cells are easier to install, especially in water. Now, you see a circular cells as a continuous wall, keyword for instance, but you can also have individual cells, for instance, for a dolphin or for a jetty, a keyword where you have uh, individual cells and uh, they are connected with a concrete slab. So this is also something like a dolphin used a lot, for instance, in um, the port of Dunkirk in, in France, where even if you go nowadays to Google, you can see many of those dolphin, dolphins that were built with um, circular isolated cells. So what, else, what are the main failure modes for this type of cells? Well, there are four of them. The first one is simply a sliding on the hot layer, like rock, for instance. It's quite rare, but nevertheless, you have to check it. The other one is called what shear failure. So it's the soil that's inside of the cell, of this membrane, which can fail. This is something that can also happen, so you have to make sure. And that's also a reason why you need a relatively good soil, so a friction angle above 30 degrees, preferably. The third method, uh, the failure mode, is the bearing capacity. So this is something like whenever you have a gravity structure, you have to consider. And then the fourth one is the overall stability. You can check it with the Bishop method, for instance. And again, here you have also to check it because it's a gravity structure. Now, you have also to be careful about piping. If you have a very high water difference between one side and the other, especially in fine sands. Now, if you go to the design methods, uh, if you look at the United States Army Corps of Engineer, the TVA method, um, they use this sliding, overturning, rotation, deep seated sliding, and so on. And the internal cell stability, you have also to verify it. Now, in Europe, we use a um, method which is a little bit different, but which gives the same result. So comparisons have been made in the past. And if you do the design according to the uh, Gelinex logarithmic spiral, normally all the other checks that are done uh, according to the USACE are also uh, pass also. So this is a simplified method, but gives relatively good results and it's easy to implement also in the software. Now in the past we used the global safety um, method, so a global safety factor of 1.5 for the stability, for the overall stability. And what you can also see is that normally this uh, spiral passes through the tips of the sheet piles. So typically the lengths of the sheet piles are the same but it's not a necessity. So you can also have the back sheet piles which are shorter it's just a question of uh, verifying the stability. It will have an influence. So sometimes if you shorten the piles at the back, you might have uh, equivalent width that is a little bit wider. So this is something that has to be checked and optimized. The bearing capacity of the soil, you also have to verify it and then check the interlock tension resistance according to Eurocode 3 part 5, which is the method that's normally used nowadays. So in the EAU, you have Chapter 8.3, you have the, uh, an explanation of uh, the verifications that have to be done. So the next slide um, is a summary of uh, what you have to take into account when designing it. For the soils, or for the, if you backfill, of course, you can choose the quality of the material, but you have a soil, uh, then normally it works very well in granular soil, so sand and gravel with a friction angle about 30 and above. The pressure inside of the cell is calculated normally with K0. So as a simplification, it's one minus sinus phi. And if you increase um, the friction angle, you increase also the stability of the cell and you can reduce the width of the cell. So this is something where you have to that you have to take into account. So by improving the soil, for instance, you can reduce the equivalent width that is required. If you have soils that are not adequate, like uh, very soft soils, very soft seals, for instance, you can either improve them or you can replace. So if it's only a small layer, the easiest thing might be to replace it, but you have to be careful because if you want to replace it inside, then you need a template that can resist the pressure that comes from the outside because if you have this uh, circular cell, it is not stable until it gets filled completely. And also a note about drivability, it's a very, uh, it doesn't have any stiffness. So 
it's very difficult to drive into very compact soil. So the global stability analysis is relatively simple. If you have a software, if you do it by hand, it's a little bit more complex because it's an iterative process. You don't know which where is the pole of the spiral which gives you the smallest safety factor, but um, it's relatively simple to program. Now, if we go further, what is the resistance that you can take into account of the soil in front of the circular cell or of the coffer dam? Well, if you don't have, uh, if it's resting on the rock, then you don't have any KP. If you have a small embedment, the easiest thing is to almost neglect it. So you use a KP of one, which is a very small one. So if you have a deeper embedment, in that case, you can use a KP with a delta which equals to zero. So the interaction in the friction between the, the steel and the soil, delta P would be equal to zero. And this gives you a KP which is above one, but you need a certain penetration into the soil. So conclusion is that normally you don't need to penetrate that much into the soil. So for KP, use one as a simplification. But if you have deep embedment, you can use a higher KP. Water is the enemy of the engineer. I said it in my first presentation, I think. And here it's the same thing because the water has two effects. The first one, it acts as a hydrostatic pressure inside of the, inside of the cell because the cell, once it starts um, uh, deforming, it's almost impervious. And in that case, it increases the pressure inside. And the other thing is that it reduces the weight of the soil. So typically, you would try to have the water level almost as low as possible. So at the excavation level, for instance, but in that case, you increase the weight of the soil and you have to optimize the position of this uh, water inside of the cells. Now, you have also to make sure that if you have designed it with a certain uh, level, well, level which varies, of course, because uh, you will never be able to drain exactly to the elevation that you have um, um, pre that you have a design. So you can either have some drain holes, like you see it on this picture, or you can also have drains inside, vertical drains inside of the cell, and then have a pump to pump out the, um, the water. But you need also a plan B just in case the pumps um, do not work. So in case of uh, failure, make sure that the water doesn't go to a level which would be dangerous for the stability of the cell, be it for the overall stability, be it for the interlock tension. So as a summary, the failure plane that we recommend is the logarithmic spiral from Jelinek. You just have to check the moment equilibrium around the pole, which is relatively simple if you use a software. And then for the KP, it depends on the penetration in front of um, the front uh, sheet pass. So if the penetration is relatively low, you use KP equal to one. Otherwise, you use the KP with the delta P equal to zero, which is relatively on the safe side anyway. And be careful with the water levels and with the loads, because the load has also a double effect. If it's inside of the cell, it increases the stability. So it's a favorable, um, but it's a load that you're not sure that it's always there. and if you don't consider it, then you're on the safe side for the overall stability, but on the other side, you are unsafe for the internal pressure. So you have to do both analysis, loads above the cell and loads and without loads above the cells. Good. There are not that many software which can do these simple verifications. Um, we have developed one internally, which we call a cofferdam. And then when people want it to verify this type of um, uh, stability, normally you can use a finite element method like Plaxis, where you would simulate the circular cell or the diaphragm wall with an equivalent width and with a double wall in which we have multiple tie rods. Now, the difficulty is to um, assess or to uh, make the assumption about the stiffness of the tie rods. 
because in fact the sheet piles or the circular cells will deform like a barrel and this is something which is relatively difficult to predict with the, um, this type of approach. Nevertheless, we have compared uh, some of the final elements results with uh, the cofferdam, which is a, easy, uh, a solution which is easier to implement. But we see that the failure plane, as you can see it here, and the safety factor are relatively close. So if you use finite element with this type of assumptions, with these uh, multiple tie rods, then it can also uh, be a good approach for the overall stability. And um, when we talk about the deformation and the displacement, so displacement is really displacement on the top uh, of the cell. And the deformation is what we uh, call a barrel effect because due to the pressure inside, which increases with the depth, there is a position which is not necessarily at the excavation level or at the dredge level where you have a maximum expansion. And that's probably also where you have the maximum stresses. Nevertheless, we recommend to calculate the maximum stresses at the excavation level or at the dredge level because this is on the safe side. When resting on rock, uh, the maximum expansion is about a fourth of the height of the cell. But the interlock stresses normally should be a little bit deeper. For the displacement, it's a little bit different, and I'll show you a real example that was measured at the project. So the displacement at the top can reach 30 centimeters and maybe even a little bit more due to the pressure that comes from one side, be it for breakwater or for a dam. So this is something that you have to take into account also for a keyword because these 30 centimeters might have an influence on the position of um, your um, final structure, so the concrete capping beam if you have one. So you have to make sure that it's not outside of the foreseen uh, line. Now this is the example uh, that I was talking. So you see uh, here they have um, drainage holes, they have also uh, vertical drains to uh, remove the water to a certain elevation. And the deformation, when it was, uh, when they lowered the water inside of this uh, small coffer dam, as you might see, actually it's, it's about here, it's the maximum of 16 centimeters, which is not that much. The rest is a little bit less, so 10 centimeters, eight, seven, things like this. And you see also another curious phenomenon is that the maximum deformation is here on the corner, which is in fact the connection with the existing uh, wall. And this is a detail that has to be analyzed in um, very thoughtfully because uh, you have to make sure that the water does not pass through these um, through these uh, places. So normally you have to weld a corner section or something to the concrete, and then through a flat sheet piles or preferably with the Z piles or U piles, you have to close it and then backfill so that you have something which is relatively flexible but still uh, impervious. In the worst case scenario, you can also use jet grouting to improve the, the, um, the water tightness of this connection. So for the diaphragm wall, there are different concepts. As I said at the beginning, normally the sheet pads have all the same uh, lengths, but in some cases, mainly old uh, projects, you'll see that they are staggered. So this is, of course, the case if you have a bedrock which is not at the same elevation, so you have to stagger them. On the other side, is this um, more cost effective than uh, if you have the same length for all the piles? Not necessarily, because when you compare both solutions, in one of them, you have shorter piles, but you have a longer diaphragm, so that at the end, um, the quantity of steel is almost the same. There is a small difference, but it will really depend on the soil properties. So it's not that straightforward. Now for the design of the um, piles itself, we uh, recommend to use zero code three part five, so EN 1993 part five, in which you have the formulas that should be used with the partial safety factors according to the European uh, design approach. So for the interlock resistance, there is a very simple formula. The resistance is equals a certain factor, beta R, which depends on the interlock resistance, and RKS, which is given by the manufacturer, and you divide it by a partial safety factor, gamma M0, which is normally 1.0, 1.05, or 1.1. Depends on the countries, because each country has the possibility to 
um, determine is uh, partial safety factors depending on their approach. And then you have also to make sure that the web will resist. So this is where the thickness of the web has an influence. And here it's very simple. It's simply the thickness of the web times the yield strength divided by the same partial safety factor. So you have to do both things, verify uh, both resistance. Now, for the junction paths, um, there is also a formula that takes into account the um, junction path. To calculate the other piles, so not the junction pile, but the other piles, the formula is relatively simple. It's the one that I showed. So it's the pressure inside times the radius, and the pressure is determined with K0. And then you have simply to make sure that this interlock tension is lower than the interlock resistance. For the junction piles, it's a little bit more complex. So after uh, a lot of tests and the research uh, also funded by the European Union and by a French manufacturer and uh, Arbed at that time. Um, they developed a formula which takes into account the radius of the arc and the radius of the cell and also the stiffness of the soil, so through a tangent phi k. And they also recommended in that uh, report to use, and it's also in the, it's not in the standard, but in the report, to use an angle of this junction pile between 30 degrees and 45 degrees. I won't go into the details for the formula, it's uh, simple to apply. However, it means that if you use it, if you would use something above 45 degrees, like it's uh, standard in the United States, like the 90 degree, this means that this um, reduction factor beta t is very high, so you have uh, less resistance. So it's not as good. Now, for small structures, projects, and so on, it's feasible, but nevertheless, we prefer uh, an angle of between 30 and 45 degrees, and normally we use uh, 35 degrees. So for this 90 degrees, it works, provided the sheets can deform sufficiently. So the welding has also to be done accordingly, but it's not the solution that we recommend. But if you look at TVA, for instance, the book that I mentioned, you'll see a few of those projects that were built like this. So for the diaphragm walls, it's much simpler because you don't need to deform the junction pile itself. It's in equilibrium. So it's a simply a geometrical equilibrium. If you use an angle of 120 degrees, which is typically the solution, and in that case, you simply multiply it by sinus of 30 degrees, and that's it. So relatively simple for the diaphragm wall, a little bit more complex for the um, circular cells. Now, if you don't work with partial safety factors, but with a global safety factor, then in that case, you have to adapt the formulas. And in that case, we recommend to use a safety factor of 2.0 for the interlock and the safety factor of 1.5 for the web. So these are the formulas that you would use in case uh, you use the global safety factor and not the partial safety factors as proposed in Eurocode. The geometry is quite also important. So you'll see in the brochures and the catalogs that there are some tables with typical recommended um, layouts. So the equivalent width that you need to design the sheet by the overall structure is simply the hatch area that you see for uh, circular cells divided by the system length. Now, you can also um, you have to be relatively flexible about that because, for instance, if you have a 500 meter uh, wall that you want to build or cover them, it's, it will be very difficult to find something which is fits perfectly at the 500 meter. So it could be 501, 502, or 499, and then you have to adapt because the important thing for the design is the equivalent width, and then the layout you can slightly adapt it. Of course, if you do it like in some projects where you will change all the angles of the junction piles, so not only uh, one uh, junction pile, but uh, one different junction pile for each cell, which makes it relatively difficult at the job site, but it's feasible. But if you use standards, if you want to make it very simple, then you will have only two uh, different junction piles or four, worst case scenario, and then you can build it relatively easy also at the job site. So this is the tables that I was referring. You'll see um, also um, an interesting feature, which is the DY and RA. So DY is a distance between the front of the arc and the front of the cell. 
it has to be in our opinion between 20 and 50 centimeters because it will deform uh, you will backfill in between the um, the cells or the arc after having backfilled the main cells and this means that uh, to avoid the fact that the arc would be um, outside uh, then it, there should be a small recess now it wouldn't be a big issue but uh, that's uh, the way we recommend to do it another thing is the the, um, the ratio r a which gives you the amount of steel so the amount of square meters per meter of wall so it's like a ratio that gives you the um, effectiveness of a solution if you uh, know uh, which equivalent width you are looking for now for the welding um, sorry i'm trying to oh. yes for the uh, for the layout and also for the welding we'll see it uh, in the next slide uh, we know that um, the maximum is 4.5 degrees of um, interlock swing four degrees if you have a sheet pile which is above 20 meters so if you need in the arcs mainly if you need more than four degrees then we can prevent the piles with a maximum of 12 degrees but it uh, takes a little bit of time and it's also more expensive so usually the technician which is doing the layout will try to reduce the amount of uh, special piles and also bent piles and um, for the inter well due to the interlock um, tolerances and the rolling tolerances you have also to be careful when you are planning um, the template when you are designing the template you have to take into account not the 500 but the 502 millimeters so there is a formula in order to determine the interior radius that is required and anyway we recommend also to take into account the tolerances of the um, of the template so that you should leave at least 30 millimeters here in this case uh, to make sure that you'll be able to close the cell otherwise uh, you might get in trouble at the job site for the junction piles if you weld it and normally that's what is done uh, today uh, then there is also a standard which is EN 12063 how to weld it if you have a junction pile for a diaphragm wall then it's a little bit easier but you need a rod with a diameter of 50 millimeters and then you weld all the three uh, small pieces which are 150 millimeters to this uh, rod and then um, for the durability talked about it in the first one so it's nothing different for uh, sheet piles i mean uh, for flat sheet piles sorry the good thing about uh, sheet pass is that normally the maximum steel stresses are at the elevation of uh, the dredging so that also a portion which is not submitted to that high corrosion rate so it's something that you have to take into account for sure we did some laboratory testing to analyze the influence of corrosion on the interlock resistance up to uh, four millimeters of loss of thickness and we found out that it's almost proportional so you see it's um, uh, proportional to the loss of thickness up to four millimeters so it's a regression and that's a formula that uh, we recommend to use when you take into account the loss of thickness due to corrosion now if i go to uh, some more practical aspects and then the installation the practical aspects is that you should avoid to transmit vertical loads to the sheet pass this does not mean that you cannot weld something onto it but if you have for instance a concrete structure like you see it here and you want and due to the um, to due to the settlements inside of the field you want to avoid the steel to punch through the capping beam so use a compressible material with sufficient height and if you have a high vertical loads to be transmitted to the ground for instance from crane rails for instance then we recommend also to use uh, vertical bearing piles so that you do not transmit this to uh, the sheet piles or to the backfill. For the delivery conditions, as I said, it's standard EN 10 to 48 with the um, tolerances on the width, which is plus minus 2%, but uh, don't panic. We normally supply uh, at 500 millimeters nominal width so that otherwise it would be uh, really very difficult at the job site if you could have 490 millimeters piles and 510 millimeters piles it would be a nightmare 
The other thing about uh, installation torrents, well, we can deliver up to 31 meters, sorry. Uh, if you need longer or if you need to splice them at the job site, be very careful because there are residual uh, stresses inside of the steel, be it flat sheet pads or uh, regular sheet pads. And if you cut and if you try to weld, then you might um, twist uh, the sheet pads. And another thing that we recommend is to also to have um, minimum staggering of the butt welds of minimum one meter so that you avoid the zipper effect. So you would have something like 14 meters and then the other one would be 16 meters or something like this in order to avoid that uh, the butt weld is done at the same elevation. And there is a procedure that um, we have developed to weld or to splice these sheet pads. If you don't do it, you might get into trouble because as I said, it might twist not only at the location where you are actually uh, welding, but over a length that can be as long as four or five meters from this point. In any case, contact the manufacturer and then he will give you some recommendations or even the procedure how to weld a sheet pass. And another thing that I might have forgotten to say is that you should avoid to weld uh, anything on the interlock because if you do that, you might reduce significantly the interlock strength and that can be very detrimental for the stability of the structure. So for the installation, it's the same thing as Ernst last time explained. You can use a vibratory hammer, you can use an impact hammer. Diesel hammers, we haven't seen them that much uh, for flat sheet pass and hydraulic press. There is no hydraulic press yet. Interesting on the, this picture, and you might not see it, is that they use this uh, clamp for the vibratory hammer and they drive two paths at the same time, not one single, which makes it uh, faster. Now, very important is to use a template and a driving cap if you use an impact hammer. Water jetting and pre-drilling is relatively uh, rare. Now, for the driving tolerances, there is also a, a standard, which is EN 12063, but according to note number four, it excludes the straight wrap sheet pass. So you should not use this for straight wrap sheet pass. Now, storage is also very important. You want to avoid deforming the sheet pads and especially the interlocks. So normally you get bundles that are up to 7.5 meters. And if you stock them and you put them one above the other, you should take care about the alignment of the blocks, be it wooden or something else. Make sure that they are aligned. Otherwise, you might deform. Imagine a couple of uh, tons uh, that are acting on the lower sheet pile. It might uh, get deformed. So transport, storage, you see a few pictures. Now it should be done. And if you have coated piles, then you have to put a block in between each pile. So you just have to follow that and then normally it works fine. For handling and lifting, also very important, if you want to handle the piles, you should use these lifting beams. Here is a picture where the lifting beam is a little bit too short. So the shape piles are 31 meters, the lifting beam is 20 and something, but it works. Um, if you don't use, like if you use a clock in the middle, you will deform the pile. You, you, can, uh, uh, you can cut it into two pieces and weld them together again, again because it's um, completely deformed. So for lifting, you have also be careful, especially if you have sheet pads which are 15 meters and more, then you need three lifting points. Like you see it on the left picture here, it's almost perfect. And on the right picture, you see how what you should avoid, prevent, but nevertheless, it does not mean that it doesn't work. So we prefer the left uh, picture because it's done according to the state of the art. On the right, it works, but it might also not work for some specific. The installation procedure, I don't have time to go into the detail, but one thing you should remember is that you need um, a template and preferably even two templates that you can work simultaneously on two cells. So if you are backfilling, for instance, on this one, you are working on one where you are installing the sheet pass, and then you could already start in the next one. So this is something that um, simplifies the task and that makes it faster. Because normally for the first cell, you have to take in, consider that, um, well, it's a learning curve, but at the beginning you need maybe two or three weeks and then Typically, what we've seen is that in the time frame of about one week, you can install one cell. But this is only feasible if you have two templates. If you have only one template, then you might actually uh, multiply the time by two. 
Now, a template is relatively expensive, I agree, but it's um, something that you have to choose. So if you have only three or four cells, maybe one template is enough. If you have 30 cells, definitely two or even more templates should be used because then you can optimize the installation sequence. A few pictures of uh, templates, just to give you, um, I think I missed one, but not a problem. So this is the different phases, as I explained. So you have one phase where you are backfilling, you actually already finished backfilling, and then you're installing the arc and backfilling. So here also you need a simplified template. Here you are backfilling because you have already finished the installation of the cells of the sheet pass and here you're working installing and threading the sheet pass so you are not yet backfilling. Another thing which is important is to put at least two or three sheet pass that come from the arc because as we've seen the cell when it's backfilled will deform and if you do not do that before you backfill then you might be it might be impossible to thread the sheets afterwards. Um, Next slide um, is um, where we see a double acting hydraulic impact hammer, an S120. It's a monster, it's something that normally you would not use for flat sheet powers. And on the right, you see um, vibratory hammer. Normally, we recommend to drive only two to three meters each time, once in one direction, and then you go back to the, you, you change the direction so that you don't twist the cell itself. Now here you see it's min minimum six meters. It's they had some difficulties probably due to that. So I think um, two to three meters is a good thing. Now uh, you can also have a very elaborate um, template. Here it's something that was developed by um, a Dutch uh, engineering company which is specialized in templates. It's quite expensive, but in any case, it's very flexible and you're sure that you have the platforms at the right elevation, you can lift them up and down. So it's a really um, a very safe template to do that. And another thing here is to drive the sheet pass faster because otherwise you have to drive each single pile one after the other. Here they developed also a clamp for triple piles so that they can vibro drive each time three sheet pass and then go to the next one and so on and so on. So it, uh, multiply or it reduces the installation time at least the driving time by approximately three because you have much less handling of the vibratory hammer a few templates pictures of templates uh, normally they are two to three meter high maybe even a little bit more you need at least two one at the excavation level or at the water level dredge level and one above so that you can thread the sheet pass without any problems here it's a, a very good one on the right where you see they have two templates. This is the upper template and then they have a working platform where the workers can actually work in a safe place and thread the piles. And another thing that's important is to fix the piles to the template as long as the cell is not closed because you will close the cell in a different uh, at least four times because you start with the um, special piles and then you join you thread the piles in between the junction piles and usually have four junction piles so you thread four you close four times the cell which is important but i don't have time to go into the details and when you backfill you have also to make sure that you backfill in the center of the cell in order to avoid instability or unsymmetric pressure on the cell so which is uh, not the way it should be done so here you see on the right a picture where they have um, uh, centered the, the backfill and you see also those two sheet pass that are waiting there uh, for the arc so first you fill the circular cell and then the main cell and then the arcs for uh, diaphragm cells sorry for diaphragm cells it's much more complex here just um, an overview cross section if you do it in the water so it's rarely done but here you would need more than two templates because the maximum distance between the cells is about uh, two meters of fill. There's also an animation on YouTube channel that you can have a look at uh, that explains the installation methods. I think that we will see it. It's last like two minutes.
So you've seen also that uh, you cannot remove the template uh, from the cell as long as it has not been almost uh, filled because as I said, um, it does not have a stability as long as it's not filled. So if you remove the template and you have uh, more pressure from outside due to waves or due to something else, it might actually collapse. So you have to be careful about that. Now, um, a few more pictures of... Um, some projects very quickly, just to show you uh, what has been done in the recent years. Um, breakwater in uh, Mejiones in Chile in a very high seismic zone. So it underwent the seismic also events in the past and the largest that they had was quite uh, high, but only the pavement settled a little bit uh, due to the settlement of the um, Bill, the structure resisted without any problem. So here also they had to drive 31 meter pile into um, down to the rock elevation, but they wanted to penetrate, but they were unable to penetrate. So it, it works also. This is a tugboat uh, key wall in the Panama Canal, relatively long structures. There were 20 circular cells with a small diameter, but here again, um, the as you can see on the picture here, the the, the the level of the rock was not at the same elevation, so some piles were a little bit, uh, especially on the back, were higher than in the front, and then they simply cut it off, so it's not a big deal in that case if you go down to the rock, but you have to verify the stability. So this is something that the engineer has to verify afterwards because it's a little bit different than from the original plans. So here, a nice uh, overview, aerial view of uh, this project in Australia with 11 uh, circular cells which was built into the water, so it's a key wall. A huge project that was uh, built in 2018 in France, it's a dike. Uh, circular cells form the core of the dike, as you can see here in this uh, cross section, but it will be covered with uh, rocks and, uh, and so on. So it's only a portion of the, of the dike and then uh, it we won't see them anymore after the finishing but sheet piles were up to 33.5 meters so over the length that we can supply so they had also to splice them for only uh, 1.5 meters this is a nice picture uh, for the bridge pier protection and as you see what they did is they pre-assembled the um, cell on a key and then moved transported the whole cell with a template to the location where they had to um, put it into the water and then backfilled it and did it again with the next cell. So relatively interesting project with interlock strengths up to 5,500 kN per meter and diameters of 20.5 and lengths up to 35.4 meters. So again, a little bit above our maximum. So they had to be spliced. A huge Breakwater, 1.7 kilometers in Indonesia, that was also um, made with circular cells, one um, diameter, 20 meters approximately, and the sheet piles were up to 26 meters and backfilled with the granular soil, so sand and um, gravel, as you can see on the picture on the left. Another one which is quite interesting is um, a coffer dam, which were used quite often in the Mississippi River and in other places to build a power station, hydraulic power station, so that you use this coffer dam. And also interesting is that you can reuse them. So you um, extract the piles and then you can use them at the same site to build a coffer dam on the right side. So this is the, also the interest of uh, sheet piles. It can be used, reused a couple of times, even though normally the circular cells, they stay uh, in the soil. Uh, one case with the, Diaphragm wall. So we saw them one from Azira, and this is the one in Egypt uh, in the uh, port of Tamietta. The port of Tamietta, most of the key walls have been built with the diaphragm wall, so this is nothing new. And also, what I didn't mention is that uh, you see that here the last cell is not a diaphragm, it cannot be, otherwise, it would not be stable. So it has to be a semicircular, and this needs uh, logically a different template. But if you have a a wall which is almost 300 meters, it's not a big issue. 
Okay, temporary coffer dams, here it's only three cells. So as I said, not a very big project, but uh, you have uh, approximately, if I remember well, 14 to 15 meters of water pressure. So this is a good solution for this temporary coffer dam. The sheet pipes were relatively short, 15 to 19.5 meters due to the substructure because they were resting on the ground, on the concrete. And here also a very small key wall, only four circular cells with a diameter of about 25 meters. But the advantage here was that it was installed during a very short uh, time because as you see, uh, it's in Canada, in the north of Canada. So they don't have that much time to install the sheet pass. And this is a solution that can be installed and executed quite quickly. Okay, so um, that's almost all. I mean, this is another coffer dam in Greece, but uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, I think uh, this is the breakwater. Nice pictures. Anyway, you'll get um, a copy of the presentation. Here it's also uh, the advantage here was that uh, they did not want to pre drill into a rock layer, which was a schist. So they used this uh, relatively small diaphragm walls, which is curious, but it's a very cost effective solution for this uh, lock. And uh, there are other pr um, projects that are very interesting, but uh, due to the lack of time, I mean, I have to stop now. So that was my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, you're welcome to ask them if you haven't done so. And anyway, um, if uh, you have questions coming up later, you can always contact us and we will try to respond. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Martins. Uh, it was really an interesting and very informative presentation. I thank you on behalf of DFI India. DFI India would also like to thank our series sponsor, that is Aslar Metal Projects India Private Limited. They are our series sponsor. And we also thank our series co-sponsor, that is Teamwork Engineering uh, Solutions Private Limited from Chennai. So before moving to question answer sessions, we'll see their promotional slide videos and then we'll meet again during question answer uh, session. ArcelorMittal's Z-Type Sheet Piling Series is especially suitable for building reliable structures in a quick and cost-efficient manner. The optimized geometry of the Z-Profile leads to superior section properties compared to other types. Steel sheet piles are used worldwide for the construction of key walls and breakwaters in harbors. Locks and bank reinforcement along rivers and canals. Not forgetting efficient flood protection systems. Additional applications are temporary coffer dams on land and in water, permanent bridge abutments, retaining walls for underpasses, or underground car parks and impervious containment walls. As the world's leader of hot rolled steel sheet piles and as the operator of the world's most innovative sheet pile rolling mill in Belval, Luxembourg, ArcelorMittal not only supplies sheet piles, bearing piles and steel tubes for foundations but provides complete foundation solution packages including fabricated special piles, coated piles, anchor material and accessories. Our engineers and sales managers have been sharing their knowledge and expertise with customers all over the world for more than 100 years. With its ongoing commitment to research and development, ArcelorMittal makes it a priority to constantly improve the performance, quality, durability and cost efficiency of its sheet piling systems. Substantial investments in the Belval rolling mill in Luxembourg now allow for the production of wider and lighter piles. The brand new AZ800 range combines improvements in the structural quality of the sheet piles, 
with technical innovations in production, thus paving the way for a faster, more competitive and value-creating solution. ArcelorMittal Sheet Piling Connecting Pioneers I now start the question and answer session. I welcome Mr. Joe Martin, the presenter for today, and I, I invite Ms. Samrita Vision from Arslar Metal to coordinate the question and answer session. Uh, thank you, Pranav, uh, and uh, thank you, Joe. We have uh, a lot of questions today. The first question I will take uh, from uh, Mr. Satish Gadam. He has a couple of questions, so I think I'll take the first question and then we will um, take the second one the, the immediately. So the uh, first question is, is cellular sheet pile method for breakwater an economic, well, that is cost economy and time economy uh, compared to stone or a concrete armor type breakwater? Um, yes, um, in certain situations. Um, I mean, the one, for instance, in um, in uh, Costa Rica and the one in um, uh, Indonesia. The reason why they used the circular cells is that they had uh, a lot of sand and a lot of gravel in the region, but they didn't have uh, concrete uh, structure or concrete the possibility to build that much concrete. Or also a uh, rock, so that was the the main reason. And the other reason is that it uh, can be built relatively quickly, so it's um, a durable solution that can be installed quickly. But I think that for those two um, structures, it was mainly the availability of concrete or the cost of the concrete and the rock in uh, in that region. Now, if you look at the French uh, project in um, in Brest. It was different because it was um, designed as a regular dike, so with uh, uh, with uh, a core in uh, in in, um, in certain materials like uh, clay and so on. But the contractor came back with an alternative in sheet piles. So it was not a design engineer, but it was a contractor that wanted to do this uh, value engineering because he thought that it uh, would be more cost-effective for him and faster. 
and especially in a lot of countries where manpower is quite expensive if you can finish your structure faster then of course you save a lot of time and, and money yeah so the second part of this question is can we use a dredged sand to fill inside these cells yes so most of the time uh, when you backfill you backfill with the dredged sand so it comes uh, mixed with water the good thing, uh, like the one uh, in, um, for instance, in, in, in Chile, it was really uh, only sand that was um, dredged. And even if it has a lot of water, it will settle. So you, you need some time to let it settle. If you want to increase the speed of settlement, then you might uh, use some vibro flotation or things like this. But be careful, not too much, because if you uh, use vibro flotation, then you can also increase the um, the pressure uh, close to the interlocks and you might damage the, the interlock. So it's feasible, you have to be a little bit patient, but uh, by the time that uh, you have backfilled, uh, you have started backfilling the first cell and uh, have erected the last cell, you have plenty of time for the settlements. So usually it's not, it's not a big deal. And the other thing is that when you're backfilling, well, you have to take also into account the fact that the sheet pads are red, while the cell is relatively watertight. So the water will, um, uh, will come to the top elevation of the um, of the cells, so it will flow over the cell normally. So it's it's not a big deal, but you might lose a little bit also of sand. So it's something that you have to take into account when you determine the quantities that you need of um, sand to backfill. Okay. Uh, yeah. So wh while we are on that, I think I'll take a related question. This is the question from Mr. Aniruddin. Um, so uh, are the drain holes, we talked about weep holes. So are they equipped with filter? So basically the question is to, uh, in relation with the prevention of loss of fines. So if we have a weep hole, won't the fines drain out? So that's... Yes, so uh, normally the weep holes have a filter. Uh, there are some companies we have, we have specialized in this type of filters and um, there is one uh, that uh, we know of in, in France but I assume that there are also in other countries and of course it is important because otherwise you have the water that flows through this um, weep hole and uh, all the fines will be also washed away so you have to be careful about that. Now if you have backfilled with a um, larger with gravel or things like this then it's not that much of a big deal. Okay so the next question is from Mr. Raj and Peter. Uh, so is how do we control uh, or maintain the accuracy of joining arc piles with the circular piles? Mostly from the installation perspective, you know, the positioning of the junction piles mm -hmm. so accurately, so as yes. to you know, join these cells precisely. Okay, so that's, uh, I would have liked to have more time to, to go into the details because the installation it's relatively simple, but you have to follow the sequence. So normally you start with the um, positioning of the template. You have to make sure that the template is posi positioned at the correct place. And then on the template itself, you will draw the position of the junction piles and of the, infra and of the other piles. So you start with the junction piles. Normally you have four of them. You make sure that they are vertical, right position, and once you have done that you fix it to the to the templates normally one fixation point at the top is sufficient and then you start installing the other one threading the other piles around this special pass and you close in between the special the junction pass so it's um how you do it i mean it's simply positioning um with the um, you would any other type of uh, pile in in the water so you have to make sure that it's at the right um, um, location but it, it's not that difficult and if it's not um, at the exact position like a few millimeters off or a few centimeters off it's not a big deal because you'll start from that point and from that point you'll close later so parameters are important of course but it's not like it has to be at the millimeter okay, okay. So uh, again, something on the tolerance. This question is from Mr. E. A. Khan from LNT. Uh, the question is, what's the tolerance in geometry during construction and how can it be accounted for? 
in design? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I understood correctly the, the question, but let me say, when you do the layout, um, the, the the um, theoretical layout with the sections around 500 or let's say 502 millimeters, um, as I said, it will anyway deform due to the pressure inside of the cell, due to the play that you have in the interlocks and also due to deformation because of the stresses in the cell itself, in the steel itself. So as I said, there might be um, displacement of 15 centimeters up to 30 centimeters. There might be a deformation of the cell itself. But the barrel effect is not a big deal. It's more the displacement that you have to consider. If it's for a temporary structure like a cofferdam, I would not be that um, that concerned if it goes up to 30 centimeters. If you if it's a key wall and, and you have to backfill it, then in that case you have to take that into account and maybe position the theoretical uh, place of the cell like uh, 10 centimeters or 15 centimeters from the expected final position and go from there but it's something that normally it's not a big deal you just have to know that it might displace at least at the at the top uh yeah so the next question is from uh stanley uh Stephanie. it's it's a big question so you have to uh, bear with me uh, in your slide uh, referring to the project in northern canada is there a critical temperature for installation in extremely cold climates uh, when we do soil freezing for example the choice of probe steel is critical to avoid brittleness especially when using liquid nitrogen minus 196 So the one in Canada was installed during the nice weather time, so it was in the summer. It does not mean that you cannot drive a sheet pass when it's uh, cold. We have supplied um, not flat sheet pass, but a lot of sheet pass to very cold regions like in Siberia, where you have uh, temperatures up to minus 50. Of course, we recommend not to drive with minus 50, but even in the standard, you can actually drive sheet pass uh, at a temperature of about minus 20, minus 30 degrees. You just have to inform the manufacturer because uh, the manufacturer will propose a quality, a steel quality, which is a little bit different from the standard one, it, that will be less brittle. This does not mean that you don't have to take care because it will depend on the temperature, uh, especially at very deep temperatures, but the steel is uh, more adapted for such uh, applications. For the installation at least now uh, once it's installed it doesn't uh, temperatures of minus 20 and minus 30 it's not a big deal it's more for the installation because during the installation you have a lot of stresses and a lot of vibrations and this is can be very detrimental for the for the steel itself so it just inform the manufacturer that you want to drive the sheet piles in very cold uh, conditions as i said minus 50 might not be if you go to minus 169 then I'm not sure that we ever install cheap pass at that temperatures. I would have to check, so it's... Yeah, we can check that. And uh, yeah, there's another question from Mr. Avi Kumar Mandal. Uh, what is the selection criteria for adopting the coffer dam made with flat sheet pipes and the other coffer dam, which is made with other steel sheet pipes, maybe, uh, uh, other section. So, is there any particular criteria when we choose a coffer dam with flat sheet piles, or say a double wall coffer dam, or in the other coffer dam, other sheet pile section section? Okay, so there are many two reasons to um, choose uh, coffer dam with circular cells. The first one is if you don't have enough embedment depths to drive the sheet pile. So, if you have a Z pile and you don't have enough embedment, you can pre-drill or you can um, cut uh, but this is relatively expensive and takes a lot of time so in that case as i said you don't need really embedment of the cell into the rock so this is shallow rock is one of the reasons why you you can use it the uh, the other one is that normally if you have a double wall cover them um, typically 
you would have one level of anchor above water and one below water uh, in order to reduce the bending moments. And with the um, circular cells, for instance, you don't need anchors. So it's something that you that you can uh, install, and you don't have you don't need divers to go and uh, install anchors below water. It's feasible. I mean, I showed uh, in the first uh, seminar webinar an example in Denmark where they still use anchors below water for other reasons, but also double uh, level anchors. But here, it's something that is easy to install. But the difficulty with the, and why they are not used as much as other double wall cofferdams is that um, the template is quite expensive and you have to do it. So this means that if you have a small structure, which is only 100 meters, which would be around four to five cells, it would be more cost efficient to have a double wall cofferdam with Z pass, for instance. If it's a long structure, in that case, you have to analyze the cost and quite often, Circular cells might be an alternative, like the one, uh, as I said, in Damietta, for instance, they have started uh, with um, circular cells because at that time, and this is 40 years ago, they did not want to do a double wall coffer dam with the anchors below water, if, if, even if it would have been possible. But here, um, they preferred to in improve the soil because it's sealed, so it's not uh, sand. They chose to improve the soil and to use a diaphragm wall because it was a faster and a more reliable solution. So all in all, I would say that a double wall coffer dam will be the preferred solution with that pass, but when it's a long coffer dam or it's a long structure, or when you have a shallow bedrock, in that case, circular cells with flat sheet pass uh, will be the, pre the most cost efficient solution, for sure. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dr. V. Balakumar. Uh, in one of your slides, while lifting the sheet pile, it was bending. So how do you decide the handling method as single point lifting or two point lifting? Uh, do you recommend strong back? Well, as uh, it's stated in the European standard, EN 12063, if you have a sheet pile, a flat sheet pile, which is above 15 meters, you should have, you should use three point lifting. Now, it's up to the customer or up to the contractor to decide because it's a risk that it takes. I mean, like we uh, saw on the picture, if you don't do it it's and you damage the sheet pile, then you have to replace it or you have to cut it and uh, splice it again, weld it. So for it's work for them. It's more work for them. And of course, as a um, project owner, I would not be very satisfied if I see that uh, sheet piles are damaged. But on the other side, uh, why 15 meters? It could be 16 meters. Sometimes um, uh, the ones that we see, for instance, in uh, in this uh, Panama Canal, some of them were only 15.7 meters, but they had decided to follow the instructions because in that case, if something went wrong, at least they would have followed the instructions and uh, it was not their fault. So I would say, if you have above 15 meters, use the three point lifting. Um, if you have less than 50 meters, I'm talking about lifting the, the sheet pass, not about handling. I mean, if you have to move it storage with a lifting beam, then uh, here again, the maximum distance between the chains should be about four to five meters. And this gives you the maximum uh, length of the lifting beam that you should use for moving the sheet pass around. Okay, so this is uh, going to be the last uh, question for today's Q&A session. I'll take again from Mr. A. K. Mandel. Uh, what is the minimum required embedment for the cellular cofferdam made with plain sheet pile? Will it be determined only for individual plain steel sections separately as these will be installed uh, or the minimum embedment depth shall need to be determined from the overall stability of the cellular cofferdam? Um, well, for the circular cells, so the cofferdams with the flat sheet piles, you have to verify both things. So the first is the stability, as I said, with this um, Jelinek uh, slip surface, so this uh, spiral, uh, logarithmic spiral. This is the stability of the cell itself. And then you have the bearing capacity, which is an additional one, and the overall stability. But what we've seen is that 
taking into account the width that you need for the, the cells, so the equivalent width that you need. If you check the overall stability, it's automatically um, checked. So I'm not saying that you should not do it. You have to do it, but normally if the uh, structure is designed correctly, it will not fail through overall stability. So the bishop do it, but normally it's not the one that will be governing the design. The minimum embedment depth for the front pass, for instance, should be around, I would say, one meter. This depends on the soil. If you have granular soil, normally it should be enough. If you have very fine sands and you have a very high uh, difference in water pressure, then you should check the piping because hydraulic heave might also be an, um, a problem. So piping, you would probably need much more than one meter. But if it's a um, a key wall, normally the water difference is very small, only one, two or three meters, something like this. And in that case, one meter might be enough. And if you are above the um, rock, so if you don't have any possibility to penetrate into the rock, there are other solutions to make sure that the backfill will not um, be washed um, be below the sheet pile, because normally you don't have um, perfect contact between the sheet piles and the rock. So what can be done is you take some sandbags inside or concrete bags or something that can be is quite heavy and then you put it around the inside of the cell around the cell and then with the pressure when you backfill it normally it will fill these gaps but since it's a sandbag with the geotextile or whatever it will prevent the soil from being washed out so this is a, a way to do it if you don't have enough embedment in the soil I'm talking about rock layers. Okay, so we don't have uh, time for any more questions, but as we always say, all the questions, uh, we will get it from DFI and we will answer all the questions in detail with probably we'll add examples and some references to case studies and we'll definitely share it with DFI who will uh, further share with all the delegates. So thank you. Thank you very much, Zhao, and thank you, DFI, for giving us this. Uh, thank you very much. See you. Bye. Good evening, all. I'm sure you would. Uh, everybody would agree that we had an excellent presentation by Martins. Lot of slides like in terms of um, embedment in rock. I'm sure you all have enjoyed. Uh, Mr. Martins, we thank you a lot for giving this lecture. An excellent one. Very simple, very illicit, and uh, I'm sure everybody would have enjoyed it and understood it. Thank you, Amrita, for uh, organizing all the question answer session. Thank you, uh, Martins, for uh, answering the questions very lucidly, which I'm sure uh, the everybody would have understood. Thank you once again. Hope to see you soon. Next, uh, we have our webinar number six on uh, 7th October at 4 p.m. The title is Innovative Engineering Solutions Using Present Method. The speaker is Mr. Tomotaka Hirose. He is from Gaikan Asia Private Limited. With regard to DFI India 2020, we welcome all the attendees to register for DFI India 2020, which will be a virtual conference. We all request you all of you to register. Dates are November 19 to 20. Please do register for the same. During this conference, the conference also goes along with uh, pre-conference uh, pre webinars. Two of them have already been conducted, one on 20th August, the other on 17th, this today. And the next one will be conducted on 22nd October. I'm sure you will enjoy this. Then the uh, virtual conference will be on November 19th and 20th. Timings are given over here. Please uh, request all of you to join for the same. The next pre-conference webinar, which is on 22nd October, 
at 4:30 pm is deep mixing equipment and field of applications of the deep mixing method speakers are dr nicolas and professor noel from belgium building research institute for the registration dfi launches uh, limited individual registrations for uh, the virtual conference which is just around rupees uh, 1500 for all details please contact mahindran or atif the email number email ids are given the phone numbers are given dfi india 2020 virtual conference brochure can be downloaded from the handouts the handouts were displayed to you some time back please download them our sponsorship lot of opportunities are still open all of you are please requested to give your sponsorship you can reach out to dfi india office to avail your opportunity you can contact ts mahindran or mohammad atif for the same the numbers are given below join us on october 7 4 pm for webinar number 6 thank you for all your attention i hope you all enjoyed this uh, webinar we we'll leave you with a short video now on value of dfi conferences thank you I come because I like to learn about what is going on in the industry. Um I like to hear from the contractors especially because you know being an engineer sometimes you need you, you know it's good to learn from the contractors what innovations they're coming up with and obviously to meet with other folks and see what you know they're working on. This conference it's one probably the most important event during the calendar year so you cannot miss it because here you can meet a lot of people uh, contractor um supplier competitors uh so as i said is the most important event in the calendar for foundation business and uh uh it's it's too important to don't be here let's say we come because we get a lot of exposure to people who use our equipment we camaraderie a lot of camaraderie you know even with our competitors we come out and we rub shoulders everybody knows everybody it's just one big happy family well it depends on whether or not you want to continue learning If you got a desire to continue to learn, then you need to be at the FI. The good thing about this conference, you can meet a lot of people over and over, so you can make a very good connection with the uh, industrial people. Networking is huge. There's so many people here, just from different parts of the country and the state and the world, even, and just seeing what processes they're using and their design methods and their equipment. and just really a lot of exposure and also getting connected with those people um for potentially future work future jobs come join us if you're if you're uh, interested in anything in this industry this is the place to be this is this is it